Yeah, it was kind of a long time ago, but uh, yeah, I, I proposed to my wife in a book. Yeah, I like to take risks. It's fun. Thankfully, she said yes, because that would not have been so fun. Uh, yeah, they had already printed 10,000 copies of a book. Can you imagine if she had said no? I'd be driving around all the bookstores with a lot of whiteout. Yeah, that would have been rough. Anyway, uh, so yeah, my name's Dave. I work at Rents Labs. We're uh, the company that sponsors most of the uh, Redis work, uh, including Salvatore, who created Redis. And uh, today I want to talk to you about Redis streams. I'm going to go over a couple things real quick. Uh, yeah, my background, I've done a lot around here, uh, mostly in the cloud and data. Um, and by the way, just quick trivia, I like looking up things on Google, like images. If you type like a fun word or a word that you want to look up and then type the word graffiti next to it, you'll find all sorts of fun stuff. It's, it's actually a lot of fun. Uh, Redis, very popular. I mentioned earlier today how many people use uh, Redis. Lots of hands went up. Yeah, if, if, if you're scaling at any level, you're probably using a lot of Redis. In fact, it's really interesting to see as the cloud becomes more popular, Redis becomes more popular. I guess that makes sense. But uh, now every time I see a survey, it shows Redis as the most popular database. Like, seriously, like, I'm not even sure how to explain that other than I, th I just think that more and more people are starting to scale and they started off with some other database as their primary database and probably are still using that database, but the parts that are starting to scale, they're like everyone just adds Redis for that part of it. Um, and that's because it's very performant. It's got a lot of simple um, data structures that you can use. Each one of them have very specific commands, so you, you don't have to figure out a whole lot. The commands do the work for you. And it's very extensible. It now has, um, it now has a module capability that extend, uh, now the community is building additional modules to extend the Reddit functionality. So we're talking about uh, pub, sub, and streams. And most of this is gonna be about streams, but um, I just wanna mention that there's a lot of use cases, a lot of very popular use cases out there that, and here's some of them. I don't know if you can read that, but you know, user session store is very popular, job and queue management very popular, high-speed transactions, of course, caching, messaging, et cetera, uh, notifications, fast data ingest, time series data. A lot of these actually are appropriate for streams. So we're starting to see some of these uh, use cases that were performed by a different Redis, Redis data structure now being performed by Redis streams. And uh, yeah, if you don't know this about Redis, that it has 10 different data structures plus PubSub, um, you really should look into it because it's, it's, each one of them is pretty awesome. Okay, so just a quick example. I do this to everybody because they don't, they don't really understand all the things you can do with Redis. But um, so obviously strings you can use for a cache. Bitmaps you can use to store ones and zeros. And one, way you might, one reason why, why you might do that is let's say you have um, you know, millions of users and you want to know at any point in time who's online right now. Each one of those ones and zeros can be uniquely addressable. So you can actually just pass in the, the, the number of the addresses and it'll return back the ones that are currently turned to one. So for example, when people log on and you want to see which one of my friends are currently online right now, you just pass in the ID location, um, the, basically the address in that ones and zeros for each one of the friends and it will return the ones that are currently online. Extremely fast and scalable way to do that. Uh, bit fields is kind of similar, but instead of ones and zeros, you can store larger numbers. Um, that's great for like ingesting analytics. Hashes, that's where you might store user session information or um, you know, user profile information when somebody logs in. Uh, it's kind of like a row in a database, a table. Um, lists is way, this was Redis' first data structure. Basically, you have a, a, essentially a queue and you can add or remove from either side. So you basically just ingest your data to one side and then pull it out in batches on the other side. That's, that's how you might ingest data really fast and use uh, Redis as sort of, a, uh, sort of a, a way to batch up the data before you dump it into another database, like a, like a MySQL or something like that. Sets allow you to store unique values. So if you're ingesting IP, unique IP addresses from users or unique web pages, you can just throw them into a set. It'll automatically eliminate all the duplicates. So it's kind of like an upsert in a way. 
and it just does all that for you and you don't have to think, it just does it super fast. Sorted sets are similar also in that they're unique, but they also have another column which is a score, and so that score in real time, you can have millions of users playing an online uh, multiplayer role playing game, and you can have um, uh, uh, their score in real time, millions of users changing in real time, and it's Redis again, will handle that no problem. Um, you can use it for geospatial indexes. So this is like what Lyft has, I think they have hundreds if not thousands of Redis servers doing this for all of their cars. So you can find what's nearby. Um, Hyperloglog -log is what we call a uh, probabilistic data structure. Have you ever notice when you do a search for a word on Google in the upper left hand corner, I'll give you a number like Redis appears you know, 4.5 million times on the web. You ever wondered how, how they do that so fast? They're probably using something like a hyperloglog -log where it's storing ones and zeros to represent words and then they flip those to figure out how many times that's appeared and they can take the entire internet of words and condense the count into about 12K of data. And so they can put that on every single server and return that extremely fast. So it's not 100% accurate, but it's close enough. I mean, you don't really need to know down to the last page, do you? Um, and then finally streams, and streams is what we're here to talk about. That's um, a recent data structure came out, well, about two years ago, but these things do take time to catch on, and uh, it's, it's similar to Kafka, it's a little different, but it's similar. Um, just quick about the company, so Redis is open source. If you're just gonna use one instance of Redis, you should just use open source, it's, it's awesome. Um, you can also use our cloud version if you want. We provide up to three, uh, 30 megabytes of data for free in Redis. Uh, at Redis Cloud, just go to redislabs.com, and we also provide the Enterprise Redis, which is allows you to do things, put like put data on um, uh, Flash, active active across multi region, 100% uh, well, not 100%, but uh, we we do everything we can possibly do in Redis uh, cluster to keep all your data safe, so it's uh, it's very reliable. Okay, so let's get into this. First of all, how many of you have used let's say PubSub before? Okay, so that's quite a few of you. All right, um, so I'm not gonna get too far into PubSub. I'm gonna do a quick demo of this just so you can all see how it works, but uh, the, the main thing that's going on with PubSub is, and the reason why we don't call it a data structure is it's actually not storing data. I mean, it kind of is, but not really. You can't say, please go store this data in a PubSub. All right, what ends up happening is you can say, hey, Redis, I want to create a channel that I want to send data out through, and if anybody's listening at that time, they, I, you know, they, I would like them to receive that data. That's basically how it works. So you are kind of st storing data, you're storing the channel name, but that's it. Um, and, and in fact, I don't even think you're really storing that. So what's ended up happening is uh, you might have um, a bunch of clients all talking to Redis, or just one client talking to Redis, and it says, hey, here's my data. Here's a change. It's usually around events. That's usually what people use it for. And then on the other side, you'll have some client, uh, other clients that are listening to those, for those changes and for that event to be triggered. And if they're listening at the time, if they've subscribed to that channel, then uh, basically it's a blocking call, so it's, it's waiting. And when uh, the, the, the channel gets triggered, they'll receive the data, okay? So let's just do a quick example of that. Let me clear out all of these. I was just goofing around here. Okay. All right, oh, that's different on there. Okay, let's see. Hold on a second, let me make this bigger. Hopefully this will make it easier for you to see. All right, let's see if this works. All right, so it's very simple to do, and a lot of people use this. Um, I'm doing it from the command line just because that way you can all understand it. Obviously, you would do this in your own programming language. So um, if you go to redis.io, click on, um, uh, click on, um, oh gosh, what's it called at the top? You go to redis.io, you click on commands. <laughs> uh, then you click on the drop down that says PubSub and you'll see the commands, all right? So 
if you type in publish channel, let's just, I'm gonna make up a channel name, call it channel one, and I'm gonna say just hi one. Okay, you can see that it just sent the message out. Now, how many clients were listening to that message? Huh? None. So that was basically like me shouting into a forest with nobody there. Nobody heard it. So, but what I can do is I can go to my second window here and I can say subscribe and I'll just call it channel to, to channel one, okay? And um, it's telling me, okay, you are now subscribed to channel one. And I'll do the same thing down here. Okay, that's gonna be hard to see this, but now if I go ahead and type in um, publish, okay, you'll see, you can kind of see that both of them received the message, right? Okay, there you go, you can see both. All right, so they both received the message. Now let's take number two here. Let's basically kill that command. And now I'm gonna go ahead and type in, hello world three, and you see the second one did not receive the information, the third one did, right? Pretty simple. Now if I go back here, and I get back, I get number three, um, I'm sorry, number two back on, and I'm, oops, let's see, I guess I need to uh, subscribe again. Okay, and I'll go back here and publish again. Let's see, maybe, maybe most of you can hear this. Okay, so you'll see that both of them received again, but you'll notice that the second one never received the information from the second, uh, or the, the Hello World 3. Right? So that data was just lost. Now, a lot of people are completely fine with this because their application doesn't need everything. You know, maybe you're simply, uh, for example, you have um, those little icons on your phone with the little red circle on it, it's telling you that you've received the notification. It's probably okay if every once in a while it's not accurate. Right, it's just kind of giving you an indication. In fact, Twitter is always telling me some number that doesn't seem to be there. Um, but it's okay, I know that there's some messages there I can go look. And that's probably what they're doing, some sort of pub sub out to all the clients that are on right now. Um, and they're probably doing more than that. But anyway, you get the idea. But there are certain situations where you don't wanna miss the data, all right? Uh, for example, you know, product inventory update. Hey, somebody just made an order, I wanna make sure that my other microservices now know that um, or like the, the, I'm sorry, the, the warehouse now knows that that, that number's gone down. Um, if your warehouse is now, a system is offline for a little bit, you don't want it to miss that information. So in that way, you need the server to maintain a history of what's occurred so that when it comes back online, it can catch up. Okay, I think you're familiar with this, this story. Um, so let's go back here. All right, so how am I doing on time? All right, pretty good. So uh, the simplest form of a stream would basically be where you have a producer. For example, like I said before, a, um, an order has been created. I wanna tell my, uh, update my inventory. And you would just simply add it to a stream data structure and that data will, uh, the change information, like the decrement of one or however many it is, will wait there until the uh, consumer can receive the information. And you can scale out, you can have many producers and many consumers. However, it's really not that easy. There's more to it than that. Um, for example, just to go in more depth, if you're collecting a large volume of data at high speeds, uh, your system may not be able to handle all of that at once. So you, again, you need to queue this up. Um, you may wanna do something with the data, transform it in the meantime, and then you're gonna output it into a stream, and then you're gonna do something with that data, perhaps analytics or whatever. So, good news, Redis has been doing this kind of stuff for a long time in various ways. Like I said, PubSub is one. People have used lists, like I said before, the list data structure as a queue to receive that data. Uh, and you can use sorted sets for it as well because you can have the data sorted the way that you need prob probably by time. 
Um, and so those have been some data structures that we've used in the past to do that. However, streams is next. So let's get more into streams. Okay, so um, with streams, not only can you have many consumers, you can have many types of consumers. So another situation like we're talking about here is you might have a message go out to the clients, but you also might wanna do some analytics on that, maybe for fraud or something, you know, harsh words or something. Um, and, or you might have another copy of it just for backup. So that's three separate um, clients, consumers, that need a copy of that data. Okay, one might be real time, the others might not be. All right, so what ends up happening is each one of these is gonna have potential for a catch-up problem. And basically what that means is the data might be coming in faster than you can consume it. For example, maybe you're doing image processing. I was recently, recently talking to a, a startup they have uh, monitors, uh, like cameras, um, online. And um, they basically are sending in about five frames per second, which isn't that much, but they're doing uh, image uh, processing on those frames to see what's in there. Is there a person or you know, what's going on? You can imagine like a, a ring, the door company, you know, door monitor. And um, so what they've done is they now have uh, 30,000 clients going at the same time, and that's a lot of data coming in, and so they need to be able to scale out on the, on the back end. And, uh, and they also need to be able to handle the backlog, because on, on occasion, it might go faster or slower. So how do you address this? Well, you scale out on the back end, however, this pre presents a problem. Uh, you're scaling out, but Who's reading which entry? Which client takes the entry? Do they kind of talk to each other and say, hey, you know, I got this one? You know, how does that work? What happens if one goes down? Okay, so uh, what happens if the network stops for a while on either end? Okay, you've got a bunch of potential problems here. So you need to have a solution that's resilient to failures. And here comes Redis streams. All right. So in the past, like I said, we've used PubSub, um, but it's like PubSub, but it's got persistence. The data is gonna be there even after it's been sent until you tell it not to be there anymore. Uh, it's like lists, but it decouples. With lists, you basically have to assign a list for each client. And with sorted sets, but it's more asynchronous. <clears throat> okay. And so it's basically handling that life cycle of the stream, of the data. Um, so, then what ends up happening is you can have, you can scale out to uh, avoid these backlogs, and you can't really see it, but these are like movie titles or uh, images. And so here's how it works. You may have many producers, and you're gonna use the command x add. If you're not familiar with Redis, uh, basically all the different data structures, their commands all start with different letters, so you can kind of tell that it's a stream because it starts with x. And then on the bottom here, I'm just gonna use an example where you don't have consumer groups. You just don't worry about that. You're just gonna put everything into one stream. And you're just gonna use xread. And I'll demo that in just a second. It's pretty straightforward. <clears throat> you can also do consumer groups so that the consumer group can then have um, multiple clients or um, consumers that are acknowledging that they've received the data and if they don't acknowledge that they've received the data, then you can have another client pick up the entries that have not been acknowledged. And this is how you make sure that you've processed each record at least once. Okay, again, here's the quick reference. Just go to, <coughs> excuse me, redis.io or Redis Labs. We have, we have it there too. All right, so here's the example. Again, fairly straightforward. X add, you name your stream. You give it a number sign, the number sign is telling you, I'm sorry, is basically saying, hey, I don't wanna come up with the unique ID, I'd rather have the server come up with the unique ID, but you can also create your own unique ID. And then you, you pass in name value pairs. So here you just see one name value pair, a person's name, pretty straightforward, but you can actually pass in a lot of name value pairs. You can do F name, L name, et cetera. And then you're gonna read, on the right here, you're gonna read and you're gonna say, um, hey, uh, I wanna read one, up, to, up to 100 entries from the streams, stream called my stream. And I'm gonna start with zero, start at the very beginning. <clears throat> uh, 
Um, and uh, you can actually request data from more than one stream at a time. That's why the streams keyword is there, because um, after that you can actually list many names of streams, and that's because a stream might not have anything, but another stream you're looking for might, and you just don't want to make multiple requests. And again, I don't know uh, if I said this before, but Redis is all about performance. It's all about speed. So everything that's going on here is directly related to being extremely fast. <clears throat> okay. And um, you can also query a range. So the, it's, it's, the client has to keep track of where it left off. The server is keeping track too, but only acknowledgments. It only keeps track of whether or not a uh, entry has been acknowledged or not. Um, and also um, if it's been read, but it doesn't keep track of the, for the clients. The client have, has to keep track where it left off reading, okay? So and this is an example where you've already read uh, and now you know perhaps um, where you started and where you've ended and you wanna just bring down that data again. You can then say, um, here, give me this range between these two numbers. Uh, one other thing, oh, how am I doing on time here? Oh boy, getting close, okay. One other thing is, you'll notice the dash zero. That's because Redis is so fast that there can actually be more entries per millisecond. So this is the, the number to the left is basically by millisecond, and the number to the right of the dash is if you actually have more entries come in within a millisecond, it will start incrementing on the right. You might have two or three or 10 or I don't know, per millisecond. It's not uncommon with Redis, so <clears throat> you might see the number over there switch. Okay, um, so let's just do a quick example. Okay, you can see that, I can't, there we go. Oops. Okay, so this is gonna be pretty simple, but you'll see how it works. Again, x add, uh, and then my stream, <clears throat> I just give it whatever name I want. And then I'm passing the asterisk, again, that lets the, the Redis server create its own counter. And I'll just make up some fields here. <clears throat> okay, now, that's the producer creating the data. What do you think is gonna happen if I now do an X read? Oops. Let's just say we're gonna, we don't know how many are there, we're gonna count, we'll just say I just want 10 right now. Um, and they say streams, and then I say my stream <clears throat> one. I'm gonna start from the beginning. Oh, what happened there? What did I do wrong? X read, oh, I know what I did. Guess what I did? This is kind of funny. I gotta log in to Redis, my client, <laughs> hello. All right, gotta type that over again. Well, at least we know the client wasn't online, right? And we'll start with zero, okay. So now it's gonna pull out, oh, I forgot to clear out my data, darn it, all right. So anyway, um, it is now pulling out three records because I would already had two demo examples out there. Um, and let's do that again here. Okay, and that should do the same. Okay, so it pulls out those. Now, <clears throat> let's go ahead and take the second one offline. And we're going to um, increment. Okay. Yeah, I'm on, out of time. So I'm gonna, I got one minute, oh, I should be out of time actually. So now let's do another, let's bring it back in and let's read again. Uh, 
I know the guy before me went out over. Okay, and, and now we can see there's a fourth entry. So even though it was offline, that data was still there, and you can go back and retrieve it. I apologize I ran out of time here, but uh, thank you for your time, and if you have any questions, I can be here afterwards. Um, thank you very much. Thank you.